We will look at it in, in detail in the class, we will do a dimensional reduction. But you see these alpha indices are uh, go over plus and minus, okay. In the two dimensional situation, plus and minus will simply refer to plus, uh, spin half or spin minus half under two dimensional rotations, okay. So any supercharge that has spin half, whether it came from a Q or a Q tilde, let us call that right moving. Any supercharge that has spin minus half from a Q, whether it came from Q or Q tilde, let us call that left moving, okay. So now we have two left moving and two right moving supercharges. The left and right moving in the sense that one of them is a function only of, you know, uh, you, 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 you will see in, in the conformal limit, one of them will be the super, supercharge relevant to the holomorphic set. Left, left and right moving. Huh? And uh, when there is holomorphic factorization, one will be for the holomorphic sector. Uh, you can see that because you see Q plus with Q plus bar will commute to give you del plus. But del plus is the holomorphic. So that is clearly related to the holomorphic set and the other one, okay. So when we go to conformal theories, yeah, we will study much of this. Okay, let us start. Okay, so uh, um, in the previous class, let me give you a one minute reminder. We, we discussed what the theories we, were we would be studying. The theories we are studying are two dimensional supersymmetric uh, field theories. The theories that are uh, uh, obtained by dimensional reduction from the four dimensional supersymmetric, from four dimensional n equals one supersymmetric theories. The theories we are going to study in the next few lectures. I am just, uh, just abelian, they have u1, um, u1 symmetries. Simplest theory will have one u1 gauge group. More complicated theories will have many u1 gauge groups. Uh, then we have charged particles. In the simplest theories, the charged particles are parametrized just by the charges under the one u1 gauge group that we have, okay. Uh, we discussed, you, I reminded you last time about the four dimensional superfield, um, this four dimensional superfield uh, notation, okay. I reminded you how supersymmetry was implemented by the Q operators and the Q bar operators. I remind, reminded you of these commuting D and D bar operators that allowed us to produce Lagrangians. I reminded you that in general, for an arbitrary real superfield, if we do a d4 theta integral, you get an acceptable supersymmetric term in the Lagrangian. I reminded you that for a holomorphic or chiral superfield or any function thereof, you do a d2 theta integral, you get an acceptable term in the Lagrangian. And right at the end of the last class, we discussed these d terms that came from a d4 theta integral of v, which looked like it wasn't gauge invariant, except that the gauge transformations. Uh, evaluated as zero because gauge transformation of V was D of a chiral superfield plus D bar of uh, its conjugate. And uh, uh, if we have D4 theta of D of something, you can zero. Now up to total derivatives always. Okay, all clear? This is all. So yes. the transformation of this V is V plus chi plus chi bar. Chi. Uh, sorry, you're right. So it's, I want to ask something about Yes. So it seems to me like a transformation of scalar protein. What do you mean? It goes, V goes to V, oh I see what you say, plus chi plus chi bar, where chi is any chiral superfield and this is its complex conjugate. So when we do uh, Taylor manifold stuff, yes. so do they have any connection? Not, 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 not obviously. This is just a gauge transformation at the moment, okay. I agree there is some similarity in that, that structure but there is no, I mean it is, uh, um, it is, um, it is similar in the sense that that is also the reason that uh, the kinetic term of matter fields is invariant under Kähler transformations, right? So it is all because once again what we do is to take integral Kähler potential over d4 theta. Once again, you know, one of these transformations changes the Lagrangian in a way that uh, evaluates to zero under integration of d4 theta. So in that sense it is similar. But I, I don't know of any deeper sense in which it's similar. And when we did this dimension reduction, yes. I was thinking this, so, uh, I, so we simply 
whatever variable we had, yes. function x0, x1, x2, x3, we removed x1 and x2. Meaning no field will be a function of it, yes. I thought dimension reduction works like this, that we compactify x1 and x2 mm -hmm. and there is an r mm -hmm. parameter and mm -hmm. r goes to 0. Mm -hmm. Is this how dimension reduction That is how dimensional reduction works, it is the same thing. Okay. Because see, suppose you take uh, something, put it on a torus, let us say in these x1 and x2 directions, we put it on a torus. Now, any field that varies on that torus has to vary, oh, ha has to be expanded in Fourier mode, okay. And the Fourier, mo Fu Fourier mode frequency is go to infinity because the Fourier modes are 1 over the size of the torus, the minimum one. So the only one that does not carry infinite energy is the Fourier mode 0 and Fourier mode 0 does not depend on these extra directions, okay. So if you just put something on a torus, you get additional modes that carry momentum on the torus directions, okay. However, if you take, as you said, the size of the, the, the torus to 0, then that effectively throws away all the other additional modes, all these additional so-called kaluza klein modes and you are left with just modes that are independent of these things, which is same as dimension. Is this clear? Okay, excellent. Other questions, comments? Fine. So let us keep going. Uh, and you know, we are back into the class mode rather than the seminar mode. So we are going to have lots of very boring formulas. I hope you will forgive me. <laughs> uh, you know, that is the nice thing about the seminar mode. You can skip the boring formulas. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, we were, we were busy writing down the dimensional reduction last time. So you remember we had uh, uh, coordinates x0, x1, x2 and x3, okay. And uh, what we did was we wrote that sigma was equal to v1 plus i uh, minus iv2, minus iv2 by square root 2 and therefore sigma star is equal to v1 plus iv2 by square root 2. Okay, these are the dimensions on uh, sigma and sigma bar. Uh, so x1 and x x1 and x2 are the coordinates on which we've done the dimensional reduction. Nothing is going to depend on them, but the v fields had indices that went overall for. Nothing, including the v field, will depend on x1 and x2, but the indices of the v field went overall for that that stage, and so these. Uh, the v components in the 1 and 2 direction have been traded for these two fields, sigma and sigma bar or effectively one complex field. Is this clear? This is a complex scalar field, okay. So now the field content in two dimensions has an additional complex scalar field that we lacked in four dimensions simply because two modes of the vector have become a complex scalar in two dimensions. This is clear, right? Okay. Now, uh, Now what we do, okay, now what we do is to take the components, okay, so what we do is the following. In four dimensions, we had these supersymmetric transformation rules for components of let's say the gauge multiplet that we worked out in great detail in the math seminar classroom uh, last, you know, last time we looked at it. You remember we got the results that were listed in Wess and Bagger. And for the case of the vector multiple, I'm going to write it down and explicitly do the dimension reduction. Just so that you see there's no miracles going on. So degrees, of freedom have actually not degrees of freedom have not changed. Exactly. Exactly. As had to be. Because for instance, the fermionic degrees of freedom have not changed. They must match the bosonic degrees of freedom. Okay. So, right. Okay, um, right. And by the way, what, what about fermions? Well, fermions were listed as psi alpha or psi tilde alpha. Okay, and these fermions had 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 uh, uh, components. Uh, we said this last time, but let me remind you: these fermions had components psi one and psi two, or uh, um, uh, or, or their bars, okay? So suppose we, t we had a fermion with components psi 1, psi 2, 
let's say for the chiral guy. Okay, we change notation, we call this psi, psi minus and psi plus. And we did that just because this component psi 1, when you measure the angular momentum in the one in the 0, 3 plane, will turn out to have angular momentum minus half. Okay? And this, if you wanted to check this, you could check this by using the representation of the Pauli matrices that, that we had uh, we had before. You could compute the angular momentum in four dimensions. Okay, then restrict to the one to uh, to the uh, zero three angular momentum, and check that that angular momentum generator just became in the chir in chiral space just became the diagonal two cross two matrix with minus half plus half. In the uh, what no. In 0, 3, in what remains a space time. So, in fact, we also have this relabeling x0 went to y0 and x3 went to y1. So, this is angular momentum in what was the 0, 3 plane in four dimensions, but is now the 0, 1 plane, space time angular momentum. Okay? Because of that, because this is spin minus half, we label it by spin psi minus. Okay, and uh, you remember we talked last time about how psi plus with an upper is the same as psi minus with a lower because of the epsilon lowering convention. Okay, you remember all that. Okay, excellent. So, now what we're going to do is to take these supersymmetric transformation rules that we worked laboriously worked out in previous classes. Oh, we actually the stuff is still here. <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> okay, so let's keep this on the board. <laughs> okay, so the supersymmetry rules we laboriously worked out in previous classes went as follows. Okay, um, the thing. What is a? Ah. Uh, you remember the gauge multiplet had the gauge field, which we called V mu, which we're going to call. I'm not sure if we called it last time, but we're going to call V mu. Okay, it had uh, uh, the gauge eno which we're going to call lambda, okay, and it had this auxiliary field D, which is of course going to be the star in our, in our story, okay. Now, by working, by looking at the super action, action of supersymmetry Q on the V multiplet, then translating that into components, I'm going to where's the amino gauge. Translating into components, looking at supersymmetry, in West Zumino gauge and then redoing the gauge transformation that took us back to West Zumino gauge. Okay, well, we got the following transformations. We got delta, um, uh, delta lambda, and delta v mu is equal to, I'll write it down and then we can I'm writing down all the rules, then we'll look at them for two minutes. Okay. Delta the lambda is equal to theta. Mm. 
and delta d is equal to minus uh, theta sigma mu d mu d. Okay. sigma mu d mu lambda plus uh, uh, minus d mu lambda sigma mu zeta theta, theta, theta. Okay. Now just uh, let's remind ourselves of uh, uh, of everything. So first, what were these? Um, what were these sigma matrices? First one. So, um, first, let's let's do the uh, okay. Fine. So first, these sigma mu matrices. Uh, I'll just list them down for you. Sigma mu were listed as sigma zero is equal to minus one zeros zero minus one. Sigma one and then the rest sigma i are the Pauli matrices. Okay, so for instance, sigma one is equal to zero one one zero. We listed them last time. This is what the sigma mu matrices, uh, what the sigma mu matrices mean. Okay, and then we had the sigma m n matrices. Uh, first, what was the index convention for sigma matrices? Sigma had an alpha and an alpha. Sigma mu mat matrices had an alpha and an alpha dot index. Uh, with this index convention, these sigma matrices were Lorentz invariant. Okay. And then there are the sigma mu nu matrices, which were basically the uh, 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 basically the Lorentz generators, and uh, uh, they were uh, they were given by okay, it's a bit comp. <laughs> Do you remember we defined sigma mu nu matrices acting on? Uh, Chiral spinners, and there were sigma bar mu nu matrices acting on anti-chiral spinners. Okay, um, these things are defined, for instance, in Appendix A of Wes and Bagger. We listed them last time. They're a bit complicated. I'm not writing them down. These are the guys that implement the Lorentz transformations on chiral spinners and anti-chiral spinners. What is V mu nu? V mu nu is going to be the uh, field strength. We will we, we, we come to that. Okay, so this is what these sigma matrices mean. Now let's just check that we've got all our um, all our index structure. Okay, sigma mu has one dotted and one un and undotted index, and that's good because it contracts with one undotted and one dotted fellow. Okay, it has a mu index here, and that's good because it's there. Okay. Similarly, this guy here has one dotted, one undotted index contracts with, an undo, uh, with a dotted and an undotted index. What was theta and theta bars were the parameters of the supersymmetry transformation? This you remember. Okay. What about lambda? Well, lambda has an uh, um, uh, lambda has an undotted index. Okay, it's the chiral spinner lambda, it's a real chiral spinner, we just keep it part of the real part, of the chiral part. Okay, and uh, here this is undotted, undotted, uh, contracting with an undotted, so one undotted left. Okay, similarly here we want one undotted index, there's one undotted index. What about here, we want no indices left, uh, and that's good because the undotted ind indices contract. Yeah. Okay, and here we want, uh, uh, uh -huh. ah, ah. And here we want no indices left, but that's good because there's one undotted, one dotted, and sigma mu has one undotted, one dotted. Ah, this is probably theta bar. Let me look. Thank you. This was lambda bar. 
Okay, so these supersymmetry transformation properties make sense and you understand them. Now, in order to get the supersymmetry transformation properties in uh, two dimensions, all we do, okay, all we do is to do the renaming that we've talked about up there. Okay, so every time we have some, some, some size, some spinners, we can write it explicitly as psi1, psi2. We rename psi1 as psi minus. We rename psi2 as psi plus. Okay? Every time we have a v mu, if, it's a, if the v mu is 0 or 3, we rename v0 as v0. We, we rename v3 as v1. And if we get uh, 1 or 2, we put them in terms of sigma and sigma. Okay? Just take this and substitute. Okay? No, no, theta bar is also there. So we are going to have four supercharges. There will be two thetas. Yeah, but the variation will be with respect to one, right? With respect to one. Here we've written down for arbitrary supersymmetry variation. Okay. Whether we're varying with respect to a q, that's the coefficient of theta, or with, with respect to a q bar, that's the coefficient of theta bar. Okay, so we put it all into one compact formula. Right. I, I think when we wrote it out last time, we wrote Q on psi is something and Q bar on psi. Here, we just put it all together. Is it clear? Okay. So the procedure now, and we have to substitute in explicitly what these sigmas are. Okay. So we actually, we're going to write down formulas with no matrices anymore. Everything will just be a number. Okay. So this substitution... I'm claiming, and then we can at least roughly check one or two of these, gives us the following. When we will throw away the second term. Q with Q me, is that guy? Q bar is that guy. Okay, so we're writing it as theta q plus theta bar q bar on field. That's what this is. Okay, clear? Okay, excellent. So now, Witten has taken the trouble to do, in fact, you know, he says, uh, dimensionally reducing the formulae listed on page 50 of Wesson Baiga. You know, he gets these formulae. Uh, these formulae so. Uh, I'm going to just list them out for you once so that you see them. Delta Vm. Okay, and that uh, V mu nu was del mu V nu minus del nu V mu. The field strength. Okay. So, delta Vm. Okay, now, Witten has a, what we called theta and theta bar. Witten, Witten has replaced by epsilon and epsilon bar. Since we're following this paper, I'll use this notation. Okay, so uh, I epsilon bar sigma m. So I'm using m for two dimensional space time. Zero and three. Zero and three, which we've called y zero and one. Okay, uh, sigma bar lambda plus I Epsilon sigma m lambda. Uh, we'll come back to this. Delta um, uh, de I, I'll tell you what, the, what each term means. Let me write out. In the uh, delta sigma is equal to minus i square root 2 epsilon bar plus lambda minus minus i square root 2 Epsilon minus lambda bar plus. Okay. Um, delta sigma bar is equal to minus i square root 2 epsilon plus lambda bar minus minus i square root 2 uh, epsilon bar minus lambda plus. Delta d is equal to minus i minus epsilon bar plus del 0 minus del 1 lambda plus 
minus epsilon bar minus del 0 plus del 1 uh, lambda minus plus epsilon plus del 0 minus del 1 lambda bar plus plus uh, uh, epsilon minus del 0 plus del 1 lambda bar minus. Um, delta lambda plus, you just see how explicit it is, okay, okay. Um, is equal to i epsilon plus d uh, plus square root 2 del 0 plus del 1 uh, sigma bar epsilon minus minus v0 1 epsilon plus. Delta lambda minus is equal to I epsilon D plus square root 2 del 0 minus del 1 sigma epsilon plus plus V0 1 epsilon minus. Delta lambda bar plus is equal to minus I epsilon bar plus D plus square root 2 d0 plus d1 sigma epsilon bar minus minus v0 1 epsilon bar plus and delta lambda bar minus is equal to minus i epsilon bar minus d plus square root 2 d0 minus d1 sigma bar epsilon bar plus plus V zero one epsilon bar minus. Okay. Uh, delta sigma bar are the plus signs. Uh, no, both are minus. Um, the reason is that if you remember, complex conjugation also flips Fermi on order. And you have to reflip it. If you remember in our first few lectures, we were very much troubled by such minus signs. Mm. Ah, there should be, let me look. There is a lambda bar on the, first, the second one. Thank you. Okay. Now, apart from the first equation, there are no spinners anywhere. Everything's completely explicit. In the first equation, you can make it completely explicit if you want by substituting what the sigma m is. You remember sigma 0 was this guy and sigma 3 was Pauli matrix sigma 3. Okay, that's we've renamed sigma 1. Okay, so if we want delta V0, we will put uh, sigma 0 in there and write it, write it out. So it's a, it's a bilinear of two terms. This will be minus, minus, plus, plus, plus. Okay, so for the first term, it's too boring to write it completely explicitly, but it's very easy to do that if you want. That's clear, right? Okay? We can, but he doesn't want to. Okay? He doesn't want to for the following reason. In two dimensions, um, spinners are a chiral spinner and anti-chiral spinner. And at least in conformal field theories, and we, as we will see as we go along, uh, what we want in this, in this system, the left movers are on their own trip, and the right movers are on their own trip. Okay? So using spinner notation obscures that fact. Because it combines the left movers and the right movers together. This is why on the world sheet of the string in string theory, we do the same thing. We write psi and psi tilde. They're part of a two-component spinner, but we look at the components separately because what's happening on the left is its own, own business. What's happening on the right is its own business. Okay? So it was just too boring to write out that first guy, but he wants to, Witten wants to emphasize the logical fact that we're going to treat psi minus and psi plus as their own objects. Okay? 
Um, in other words, we will be dealing with chiral two-dimensional spinners. And chiral two-dimensional spinners are one-component objects. Okay? So just like we dealt with chiral four-dimensional spinners then, rather than the full Dirac spinner. Here, once again, we'll deal with chiral two-component spinners, and those are psi minus and psi plus by themselves. Okay? So that's why two-dimensional supersymmetry, if, especially when chirality plays a role, is very similar to one-dimensional supersymmetry. There are no matrices anywhere in some real sense. Okay? Excellent. And there are similar relations for the matter fields, which I'm not going to write down except for the parts that we need. Uh, but you understand how, how we can get them, right? So now, let's, I don't know, let's pick one random guy here and make sure we understand. Um, uh, let's uh, make sure we understand how this is working. Um, suppose we pick this guy, for instance. Okay, oh, let's say this guy. We Delta sigma here came from that relationship, from the delta V relationship. Okay, if we use one and two components, or plus and minus, the plus and minus, you know, one plus I2 and one minus I2, components of V, we will get this. So if we use plus and minus, we have to re uh, replace sigma mu there by sigma plus or sigma minus. Where sigma plus is 0, 1, 0, 0, and sigma minus is 0, 0, minus 1, 0. Okay? So one of those components, let's say I do plus, where the plus or minus, you have to keep your wits about you because upper and lower. I'm not going to try to be so careful. But if, uh, let's say I do one of those components, it will be a lambda, lambda bar 1 times theta 2. One we've decided to call minus, the other one we've decided to call plus. So you see we're going to get a combination of one plus and one minus. And similarly on the other side. Okay? We could go through them all here. There's no benefit to doing that. I won't, won't do it. It's just totally trivial putting into the formula. Is this clear? Are you happy with this formula? Okay. In a, a similar manner, we can do the dimensional reduction of the, for, uh, of the supersymmetry transformation formulae for scalar fields, with, meaning for the charge fields, the chiral multiplets. Once again, it's the same page 50 on, in West and Bagger that's listed in the same, you know, in the same begin split, end split of the same equation. <laughs> okay, we can put, do, it, do it there as well. Okay, fine. Okay, so we've got these scalar fields which had phi, psi, and f, and they have their own transformations very similar to these. Okay, there's no complication in this case of like the v getting or giving you a new, new field, just the fields that you see are the fields that you get. Psi plus psi minus, psi bar plus psi bar minus. Okay, excellent. Now, now that we've got the fields in the game, we're going to ask the following question. Okay? We're going to ask the question, how do we write down a Lagrange? In four dimensions, we reviewed last time how we wrote down the Lagrange. Okay? Uh, we reviewed last time how we wrote down the Lagrange. Okay? The part of the Lagrangian, which is scalar potential phi by e to the power v phi d4 theta, that doesn't change. Continue to do that in two dimensions. The part of the Lagrangian that was superpotential, d2 theta w of phi plus cc, that doesn't change. You continue to do that in two dimensions. Okay? Basically, nothing involving the matter field changes because the matter fields just go. You know, directly down. Okay, but for the gauge fields, we use a different trick to write down the Lagrangian, and this is sort of interesting. Okay, for the gauge fields, we use a different trick to write down the Lagrangian, uh, and this goes as follows. See, 
in four dimensions, if we wanted to maintain Lorentz invariance and integrate over half of superspace, okay, if we wanted to maintain Lorentz invariance and integrate over half of superspace, we had only two options. We can integrate over d2 theta or d2 theta bar, right? Because theta 1 and theta 2 are rotated into each other by Lorentz transformations. If we integrated over d theta 1, d bar theta 2, that would not be Lorentz in there. Okay? But what about in two dimensions? In two dimensions, theta and theta bar are just two separate flavors of supersymmetry. Each of theta 1, each theta has a left moving and a right moving part. Theta bar has a left moving and a right moving part. Okay? So there are two kinds of supersymmetries. This is why we call it n equals 2. Right? n equals 2, comma 2. There are two left moving and two right moving supersymmetries. The left moving supersymmetries are theta plus and theta bar plus. The right moving supersymmetries are theta minus and theta bar minus. Okay? Now, because of that, there is no Lorentz invariant constraint in pairing theta minus with theta plus. As far as Lorentz invariance is concerned, we get as good a spinner by pairing theta minus with theta bar plus. Okay? And therefore, instead of writing, so now we have a new kind of chiral superfield in the game. Okay? The kind of superfields that we talked about previously were those annihilated by del alpha phi. Del, 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 del bar alpha. This is equal to zero was our definition of chiral superfields. Okay? Now we define a new kind of, new kind of uh, uh, chiral superfield, which uh, in the literature is, is often called a twisted chiral superfield. And a twisted chiral superfield is de defined by the requirement del plus phi uh, is equal to del minus, let, let's call it sigma. Del minus sigma is equal to zero. Is this clear? Okay? M making Lagrangians out of twisted chiral superfields. Okay? will be as two-dimensional Lorentz invariant as making them out of chiral superfields. It's just a different pairing to complete a spinner. Is this clear? Okay, there is no, uh, because, uh, because Lorentz transformations do not mix. Because Lorentz transformations just give you one phase for plus and the opposite phase for minus. Yeah. So there's no sense in which they're paired. This is, what, this is the fact that, uh, super, that uh, spinners can be chiral in, in two dimensions. All representations are one dimensional, right? In four dimensions, uh, bar and unbar couldn't mix, so we could uh, do... Yes, bar. exactly. The thetas mixed among themselves, q's mixed among themselves, or the thetas mixed among themselves, the, the bars mixed among themselves. Is this clear? Okay, now, if we were interested in, a, okay, so there's new model building possibilities in two dimensions. Okay, that. Clarify, these two conditions, these two are zero, are two separate conditions, right? Yes. Not like they are identically zero. Both no. are separately made zero. We demand both conditions are true. So this was the same here. We demanded this for plus and minus. There were two conditions. Once again, we demand for plus and minus, except we demand. But their plus and minus was demanded because both went into each other under Lorentz. It's true. We needed to do that for Lorentz invariance. But we did make the demand for two conditions. It was forced on us by Lorentz invariance. Okay. No, no. No, we, 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 we choose to do this. 
One could do that in a Lorentz invariant way, and we we choose not to. There the problem was D D bar anti commutator was non zero, right? So you couldn't uh, um, D D phi equal to zero. Right? Okay, excellent, excellent point. You if you if you did that, you would get a, a momentum, which is one of the projected out momenta here. You would get a momentum in the one two direction, but that there's no momentum. That's not part of our algebra anymore. Excellent. That's an excellent way to say it for why it's consistent here, despite being a dimensional reduction. Because in going from one to the other, we've thrown out some momentum. Okay, and that's exactly what would appear on the other side. Is this clear? So the anti commutation between d plus bar and d minus would be. Uh, yeah. Uh, so d, uh, d plus bar and d minus would, would basically give us a momentum. Yeah. So let's first do it in four dimensions. We would get something like d alpha d bar beta dot is equal to p alpha beta dot. Something like this. That would be numbers and so on. Okay. Now, let us look at, so, so, so suppose we want to do d, we want to do these two. d plus bar and d minus. Okay, we will get a p minus plus dot. Now, minus plus dot is an off diagonal element in, the, in Pauli matrices, and those only click with sigma 1 and sigma 2. And you've thrown those away. So, this is 0. Okay, this is another way of, this is another way of reiterating that spinners have now become reducible representations. Yeah. Yeah. What was one spin has now become two representations. Well, this is the same, another way of saying the same thing. They're excellently said though. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Heineken. Uh, yes. Good. Yeah, so under, f for, you can ask if you do a dimensional reduction, hmm. what happens to a field which carries some indices? And there it will precisely be branching rules from SOD to SOD minus 1. Okay, and in fact we've done two dimensional reductions, so in this case SOD to SOD minus 2. And exactly as you said, a vector is going to a vector and two scalars. Yeah, if we had a tensor it would be exactly that. Right? Because it's precisely that. Because in the higher dimensional theory, you had an SOD invariance, and you're preserving only an SOD minus two of it. So it's precisely that branching rule, but for the indices of fields. Yes. Excellent question. Okay, other questions or comments? Okay, excellent. So, we will continue to allow ourselves to deal with ordinary superfields, of course. Those will obey d bar plus, phi is equal to d bar minus phi is equal to 0. That's what we're going to get from dimensional reduction of ordinary four dimensions. Now at this point we could have taken two roots. We could have said, okay, we won't stick to models we get from dimensional reduction for four dimensions. We could have tried to look for matter theories, theories with matter in which matter itself trans trans uh, transforms, some matter fields also transform in some twisted chiral superpotentials. Yeah, I'm saying what we had previously in four dimensions gives us this, but this was a, this is ordinary superfield. So there are two kinds of chiral superfields in two dimensions. There's ordinary chiral and twisted chiral. Now, if we just did dimensional reduction, we would get only ordinary chiral. We could say we're interested in being more imaginative and people who want to study mirror symmetry of an R, okay? But that's not what, what our goal for today is. We're not going to, we're only going to look at the theories that were obtained from dimensional reduction of four dimensions. Since we started there with ordinary chiral multiples, we get only ordinary chiral multiples. So you might think I'm wasting your time. Why am I talking about twisted chiral multiples if we're never going to deal with them? The reason I'm talking about it is that there's something interesting. 
the gauge multiplet becomes a twisted chiral multiplet in two dimensions. Okay, this is what I'm going to try to explain to you. Okay. Okay. Consider this quantity, sigma is equal to 1 by 2 root 2, okay, d bar plus d minus. Now, this is of course, um, uh, this is of course, some, where, where this d is covariantized, okay. Every derivative is replaced by including a, co uh, including a gauge covariant derivative. Okay, so this is d a, let's call it v. It includes every every derivative as a gauge has has a, has a v mu in it. Okay, if we had um, uh, okay, now. When, when we study um, this quantity, okay, firstly, this quantity, why are we interested in this quantity? See, if we took ordinary covariant derivatives, not these super guys, we took ordinary covariant derivatives and took that commutator, what do we get? We get the field strength, okay? So this D has a term which has ordinary derivative in it. So there will be a part, namely like the theta theta bar part, which will be ordinary derivative. So you see that when we take this commutator, we will get commutator of those ordinary derivatives. And so part of this multiplet will include the, will be the field strength. Is this clear? Okay. But, uh, but because this is a commutator of d plus and d minus. By using the Jacobi identities for anti-symmetric things, you can easily convince yourself that d bar plus on sigma, okay, with this is in a joint representation. Anyways, d bar plus on sigma, which uh, is equal to d bar minus on, on sigma, which is equal to zero. Okay, the way it will work is that when you work that out, you will get uh, uh, a d bar plus anti-commutator d bar plus which is 0 and then you'll get two terms with d bar plus d bar minus. The signs will be such that they will be the same. Oh, sorry, they will cancel and so you'll get, you'll get 0. Okay, so this is something you can easily work out either abstractly or by hand. Okay, so this construction here, this construction here, um, gives us, um, uh, uh, th this construction here gives us uh, uh, this twisted chiral multiple. So, what? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Now, if if one works this out completely explicitly, this is the same as sigma, which is equal to half. Uh, okay, this works out half sigma minus i square root 2 sigma plus lambda plus minus i square root 2 sigma minus lambda minus plus square root 2 theta plus theta bar minus d minus i v 0 1.
OK. Is this clear? OK. Uh, I was just wondering uh, how did you get all these fields of sigma sigma to the action? Those are the derivative operators, differential operators. You covariant is just and then. Let me say exactly what this means. Let me say exactly what this means. See, suppose you've got a field phi here, and it is, um, suppose you have a field phi here, which is a chiral multiplet, okay? Now, since phi is gauge variant, to put a condition like D on phi is equal to zero makes no sense. You want a gauge invariant condition. Okay, but you know how phi transforms. Phi transforms like, um, like uh, uh, phi goes to e to the power whatever i lambda minus i lambda bar phi. You remember that uh, gauge transformations in superfield notations were generated by chiral superfields, lambda. Okay, so we want something that will be left that will undo this, okay? And that thing is e to the power v. Because v transforms in the opposite way, okay? So the condition that we put here, okay, is ordinary d alpha on this is equal to zero. Now that is equal to e to the power v times what I'm calling dv alpha on phi is equal to zero. Now this, what is the, what, what is the difference? The difference is, an, uh, is a quantity d alpha v. Is this clear? Okay, so this derivative, this, the derivative I talked about here, I'm sorry I went too fast for that. That derivative was ordinary d alpha plus this d alpha v. Okay, so this quantity that I've written on the sigma is essentially, in fact, maybe exactly, it may be written, so, is essentially d bar plus d minus of v. Okay, now v is whatever it was, you plug that in and this is what you get. Okay, because v had the full gauge superfield, it had both v mu as well as sigma. That's where all the sigma stuff is coming. Is this clear? Okay, so uh, it was important that that was the dv up there, the gauge covariant form of this, this chiral superfield. That was it. Okay, uh, notice that this, as we predicted, the theta plus the, the theta plus theta bar minus component of this has the field strength in here. Okay, we predicted that from the fact that we expected that the derivative would become gauge covariant derivative at the theta order, and therefore will give us this field strength. And you know this expansion here, this expansion here, uh, this expansion here of this uh, uh, of this twisted chiral superfield look at the first few terms it's only a function of theta plus and theta bar minus theta plus theta bar minus theta bar minus oh uh, at some point of course that will start failing and that's failure can be accounted for by defining the appropriate y coordinate. So every twisted chiral superfield is a function only of theta plus and theta bar minus. If we make it a function of theta plus and theta bar minus and y mu, which is equal to y. Uh, uh, yeah, which will be equal to you know x mu plus i theta bar theta alpha sigma mu alpha alpha dot theta bar alpha dot. Is 
If you remember what we did last time, it's very similar. Okay? So we could get rid of those more complicated terms in this expansion here by making it a function of y. More complicated terms are the Taylor series expansion or of this, this expression in the fact that we realize that y is not the same as x. Okay? Otherwise, morally speaking, you think of this as a function of uh, theta bar minus and theta plus just in the way we morally speaking think of an ordinary chiral multiplet as a function of the two thetas. Theta bars come along but because of, the, because of y. Also, if y is 0 and y is 3, I mean, we, uh, that it should have two space terms. Um, yes. Uh, uh, well, I think it will have, uh, just a minute, good point, good point, good point, good point. Uh, yeah, 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 I think you're right. I think everything here will be just 0 and 3. Right, yeah, I think that's right. Because ev everything here is a function only of x0 and x3. Hmm? So instead of x0 and x3, we make x a uh, function of y0 and y3, and then that will eat up the rest. Okay, excellent. Okay, so this, this is what twisted chiral superfields are. Okay, and this is what, you know, the, the, the field strength here is a twisted chiral superfield. Okay. So now, if I wanted to give a kinetic term for this twisted chiral superfield, what should I do? Well, how do we give a kinetic term for an ordinary chiral superfield? We wrote down a Kähler potential. Huh, exactly. And in the, in the case that we wanted it to be nice and super renormalizable, or renormalizable, we wrote down just phi fiber. So in the similar way here, what we might try is to just write sigma sigma bar d4 theta to write down the kinetic term for this field. Okay? And this kinetic term works in the sense that it contains an, uh, uh, I'll write it down exactly with a minus 1 by 4 e squared. If you write this down and you open it out, you find this is equal to uh, 1 over e squared into d2y uh, v0, 1, the whole thing, squared by 2 plus d squared by 2 minus i lambda bar d0 minus del 1 lambda plus i lambda bar d0 mm. uh, and this is plus and plus this is minus and minus d0 plus del 1 lambda minus plus uh, minus del mu sigma the whole thing square. This is analogous to that, though we get it very differently. This plays the role of that. Remember, that was an integral over half of superspace. Okay. Here, what we've done is to take the field strength multiplet and make it like a matter multiplet. So we give it kinetic term, just like we gave matter kinetic term. Okay. That's nice. However, there is one thing that we have to keep, uh, we, we have to be sort of aware of. Now that we've got the field strength multiplet as a twisted chiral multiplet, in addition to this kinetic term, we could also give it a twisted superpotential. Okay? So the most general Lagrangian we're going to write down, okay? The most general Lagrangian that we, we're going to write down or that we can write down involves also, uh, let's see, which ones? 1d theta yeah, d plus and d bar minus. Yeah. 
It's always very hard to keep track of because whether you're doing up or down or whatever. But uh, W of sigma plus C sigma. This is also a nice supersymmetric equivalent. Okay. In the UV, we're going to choose this Lagrangian in a very simple way. And we will see, yeah, by the end of this lecture, we will see why. Okay. We're going to choose this Lagrangian just to be linear in sigma. We will choose the Lagrangian to be i t by 2 square root 2 d2 theta by d2 y d theta plus d theta minus sigma minus i t bar by 2 square root 2 d2 y this is the minus complex conjugate uh, or plus complex conjugate d, uh, d theta minus d theta bar plus sigma bar. Theta bar minus, yes. Theta bar minus, yes. Theta bar minus. Theta bar minus, and here uh, the opposite. Theta minus, theta bar plus, yes. Okay? We're going to choose such a term. Now, if we choose such a term and just write it out, okay, what we want is the part of sigma that was theta plus and theta bar minus, and had no derivatives, no total derivatives. So theta plus, theta bar minus, and no total derivatives, that's this term. OK? So this is, I, uh, now there are various factors of i. I'll just write it down from Witten. So we get this is um, d to y minus r d plus theta to pi v 0 1 where t was equal to i r plus theta by 2 pi. Okay, t was a complex number. I write it as its real part plus its imaginary part. Okay. I write it as a real part and imaginary part, and I just plug in here. So from here, I got uh, d minus iv0. Okay. From the other term, I got a d plus iv0. That was, where was that? Uh, well, this just uh, would be in the complex conjugate. The sigma bar. I will get a d plus i0. And then I plug them into, you know, I, uh, it was this plus complex conjugate, so it becomes real. It becomes r d plus theta by 2 pi v0 v zero one, where this was the real and imaginary part of it. Yeah, it has a ordinary number, right? What? It has a ordinary number, right? Theta. Uh, this theta is an ordinary. Sorry, yes. This is not super simple. Yes. <laughs> this is like the theta parameter of QCD. Okay. So let's look at this term. This term is the file Leopoldus term that we discussed in detail last class. The two-dimensional version of that pi Lyot plus term. So R D, it will have the same. Uh, it will have the same uh, physical implications, as we will see very soon, as the ordinary pi Lyot plus term. Okay, what about that theta there? That theta is very much like the theta parameter in ordinary QCD. You see, in ordinary QCD, we write theta f wedge f. In two dimensions, there's no space for f wedge f, but we can write theta times integral f. Now, if we write theta times integral f over 2 pi, on any compact you know, cycle, integral f is integer quantized in units of 2 pi. Okay? So this will always evaluate to an integer. Okay? And therefore, if you have an, uh, a theta behind it in e to the power is, that theta is a periodic variable with periodicity one or two pi, depending on your conventions. We've chosen it so that uh, uh, it will be presumably two pi. What? 
What second? What? F F one three sorry F zero three and F one two separates theta term. Uh huh. And then it's like flux of those both. Wait, sorry. You are trying to get this from dimensional reduction from four dimensions? Yes. Theta term is. We're not, we're not getting it from there, Be, because that would require, in order to be triggered, it, in some sense, you, well, it would require to be dimensional reduction along with a flux, yeah, flux of on the one two directions. One, two directions. We're not trying that. We're just independently writing down a theta term for two dimensions. Okay, just like you can write down a term in the Lagrangian. We just independently write it down here. Now this is a famous term. Uh, whose physics has been discussed in great detail by, let me give you one guess, in the 19, late 1970s. Edward Witten. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, he famously discussed this theta term, and we will, uh, in the course of our lectures, recall his earlier discussion and uh, apply it to this problem. Um, that theta terms in two dimensional QCD, uh, two dimensional QED, or two dimensional QCD are interesting things and lead to interesting effects uh, was something that Witten discussed the, uh, you know, very early on. Okay. Uh, so this is you know, some famous term that we know appears and has interesting effects in two-dimensional Lagrangians. And it comes out naturally as part of the complexification of the Filioplus data. Okay. So there are two things that we've learned here. In four dimensions, the Filioplus D term was a real, was, this R was a real coupling because it came behind integral of a real superfield, d4 theta times v. The Filioplus d term here, okay, can, is much more interesting because it's part of a complex multiplet. The coupling constant is a complex multiplet. Okay, and this is going to play a crucial, crucial role in our discussion. That the d term is complexified by this theta parameter. We will see what 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 implications that has. Okay. Um, now, this is the Lagrangian we're going to choose to start with to work in the UV. As always, the interesting question. Oh well, not always, but you know, eighty percent of interesting quantum field theory asks the following question. I don't know, maybe fifty percent uh, asks the following question. I give you this. Simple Lagrangian in the UV, you tell me what happens in the IR. Okay? So the fact that we started with a simple Lagrangian in the UV is no guarantee we'll get a simple Lagrangian in the IR. We might get a complicated super, twisted chiral superpotential for sigma in the IR. Okay? That could happen. And we will see examples where it does. Just like we got a complicated affleck dine seinberg superpotential for the M field in four dimensions, even though the superpotential in the UV was very simple. That's the kind of discussion we will have. Okay, right now I'm just laying out the kinematics and specifying the UV Lagrange. Okay, so we've come to the end of the boring part of this, this uh, uh, of this discussion, because I don't think we'll need any more expansions of superfields. Uh, now, okay, we, we're slowly transiting to the more interesting part. But any questions or comments about just the, the, the mechanics? Okay. Great. Now, the one last thing that you, one last bit of algebra we need to do, but this is less boring because it's completely physical. Is this, okay, so first let me specify that, so what model are we gonna study? We're going to study the physics of a model system. Okay? Our model system is going to contain, is going to contain um, some number of scalar fields, let's say phi i, okay, with charge ei. We'll spoon specialize this charge content, as you will see. Okay? It's going to contain this some number of scalar fields. Uh, phi i with charge e i, and um, it is also going to have a gauge multiplet, the, the sigma. Okay. In the UV, we start the model 
with the usual kinetic term for the gauge fields, the usual kinetic term for the scalar fields. And we will allow ourselves the freedom to write down the Fileopolis term, the linear chi twisted chiral superpotential for the gauge field, and perhaps some interesting superpotential for the matter fields, which we will allow ourselves to tune in order to get something interesting. Okay? And then the, go or the, the goal is to find what, what happens in the IR with these theories. Okay. So, the data that we put into the specification is simply W, W of phi i. Okay. Now, when we do this, one key question is what is, as you remember from our studies of four dimensional physics, a key question is just classically first, what is the potential of the theory? Okay? So, as you know, the potential is sum of d squared plus f squared, but there's more. Okay, why is there more? There's more because what was in four dimensions, something involving an interaction involving a gauge field, could now in two dimensions become a potential. Okay? Now let's remember that in four dimensions we had minimal coupling between scalars and the gauge field. So in particular, we had a term which was a mu squared, e squared, a mu squared times mod phi squared for every field. So when we do the dimensional reduction, a mu squared will dimensionally reduce to a mu squared plus mod sigma squared. Because a12 was sigma. So we will have a new potential term that had no analog in four dimensions, which is of the form mod sigma squared times mod phi i squared. Okay, so plus an explicit so plus an explicit uh, these are the charges of the fields. What? Of all the scalar fields. So there are these fields phi i, they carry charge q i. Okay, so this is going to be our total potential for all the scalar fields in the model. And what are all the scalar fields in the model? Well, there are scalar fields phi i, the complex scalar field phi i, and then there are complex scalar fields sigma. Okay? So in addition to the scalar fields for each matter field, there's also one additional scalar field, sigma. We've written down the full uh, potential for all of these. Now what was the D term? The D term we saw before, it was qi phi bar i squared sum over i minus r. I may have got some number wrong here. No doubt Witten has written it exactly. Ah. Yeah, perfect. Uh, in fact, it's exactly correct. Maybe a half. Okay? That's this D term here. What is the F term? F term is just del W by del phi i, del W by del phi bar, del W bar by del phi bar j, phi bar i. Okay? And then plus 2 sigma sigma bar sum over i qi squared mod phi i squared. Okay? Great. This is our Lagrangian, this is our potential, and we're going to discuss it in a minute. Okay? Before we turn to discussing the vacuum of this theory, which is where we're going, okay? Before we turn to discussing the vacuum of this theory, let me take a minute to discuss the symmetries of the theory. To 
to start with, imagine that w is equal to 0. OK? To start with, imagine that w is equal to 0. OK? Now, uh, what was my Lagrangian schematically? My Lagrangian was um, d4 theta uh, phi bar phi plus d4 theta uh, d4 theta um, uh, sigma uh, sigma bar sigma plus d2 theta sigma plus cc and that was it. Okay. I'm now going to look to see whether we have any R symmetries in this theorem. Let me remind you that an R symmetry was a symmetry that uh, 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 under which uh, Q, uh, Q had charge, let's say one. Okay, Gagino had charge one, for instance. Okay, so theta transforms under the R symmetry. Okay. Um, so, under a transformation giving phi absolutely any charge, okay, let's say charge zero, okay, uh, under a transformation in which theta picks up, um, theta picks up a phase, but theta bar picks up the, the opposite phase, d4 theta terms are fine. Giving sigma any charge, same for the d4 theta sigma term, sigma bar sigma. Okay, but uh, uh, what about this guy? Okay, what about this guy? Well, this guy would have to transform in a particular way in order for this uh, this R symmetry to be uh, to continue to be a symmetry. Now, in four dimensions, we talked about we, we, we're going to come back to the transformation in a moment. In four dimensions, we talked about R symmetries for in which both components of theta, theta plus and theta minus transformed in the same way. But because supersymmetry has become chiral now, theta plus and theta minus can do their own thing. So we could try to do the following. We could try to search for a supersymmetry under which theta plus goes to e to the power i alpha theta plus and theta bar plus goes to e to the power minus i alpha theta bar plus. Whereas theta minus and theta bar minus are just left unaffected. We could search, we could try to search uh, for such a, a, such, a, 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 such an R symmetry. This would be a left moving R symmetry. Okay, and similarly we could search for a right moving R symmetry in which only the minuses are affected. Sigma should then transform under both. Right? Exactly, sigma will transform under both. Okay, so we can find such a symmetry, provide, so this guy and this guy are still invariant. As long as sigma has charge one under both of these, okay, because d2 theta is a derivative, so that kills one. Okay, so as long as sigma has charge one under both of these symmetries, okay, as long as sigma is charge one under both of the symmetries and then phi we can choose to be anything because we've got the absence of a super potential. Let's say at the moment we set it to be zero, uh, phi, uh, phi charge equals zero. Uh, this is a, a symmetry classically of this Lagrangian. Okay. Now, so we just assign sigma charge one under both of these transformations and then our Lagrangian has two R symmetries, left moving and a right moving R symmetry. Okay, let's be completely explicit. Um, um, let's be completely explicit. Under one of these two symmetries, let's call it right moving, psi plus F sigma and lambda minus All have charge have charges minus one, minus one, one, one. 
let's see how this works. OK? Yeah, under the one that acts on theta plus. OK, this has charge minus 1 because it appears in the expansion of the scalar field as theta plus, plus psi plus, the chiral Lagrangian. This carries charge, let's say, plus 1. Therefore, this must carry charge minus 1. OK, that's this minus here. OK, now how about uh, f? Yeah, f appears in the theta plus theta minus as theta plus theta minus f. Normally, when we were working in four dimensions, okay, that meant that f carried charge, um, you know, twice as high. But theta minus is neutral, uh, so this guy carries the same charge as cyclos. Okay, how about sigma? Well, sigma was the first component of the sigma superfield. In order that this be invariant, it has to carry charge one. Okay, and then how about uh, lambda minus? Theta minus uh, exactly. Same as, same, as same as sigma because it's only a theta minus and it's neutral. Theta plus, uh, uh, on, on the other hand, will carry charge zero. Uh, lambda plus, on the other hand, will carry charge zero because there's an extra theta plus there. That, that, Everything else is uncharged. These are the only charged fields. OK. This is clear, right? OK. So classically, our theory has these chiral, uh, chiral R symmetries. And I've written down for right movers. This is, of course, a similar one for left movers. Clear? Now, quantum mechanically, is this actually a symmetry? Always very dangerous when your charged fields are chiral under a symmetry. When you've got non-chiral charged fields, quantum mechanically it's always a symmetry. Because you can always regulate the theory with a Pauli Villas regulator. Okay. So non-chiral matter content um, cannot you know, behave the same way in the massless and massive case, because you can regulate, uh, regulate the theory. Okay, non-chiral content cannot have anomalies. But chiral matter is always very dangerous. So if we look at the sum of the left moving R charge and the right moving R charge, that will be non-anomalous because that will be non-chiral. But each of them separately are in danger of being anomalous. Now, what is the condition for something to, what is the coefficient of the anomaly? So firstly, what is an anomaly in one plus one dimensions? In four dimensions, the anomaly was the equation del mu j mu was number times f wedge f. In two dimensions, what is the equation? Yeah. f, del mu j mu is f. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in four dimensions, the condition was a quadratic kind of condition, right? Because you had f wedge f. So, it was the, the coefficient of that came with a. Uh, uh, with a t, t, and the third t as well. Okay, here one of the two, three, uh, one of the three t's is just the rotation, and the remaining guy is the charge. It's quadratic instead of cubic. Okay, and since we are assigning all of them the same charge, okay, the anomaly. The, the anomaly is proportional to del mu j mu is proportional to star of sum over q i okay, times f. Is this clear? This It's clear that it's a linear condition, right? A linear in, the, in the, uh, the, the charge field. What? Uh, the, uh, yeah. Why linear? Okay. Okay.
in four dimensions we have this triangle diagram. Okay, we have J, J, J here. Okay, and this, this diagram was relevant to anomalies because we had del mu, j mu is F wedge F. Is this clear? So the gauge part came quadratically because there was F wedge F. So it cared about the represent, gauge representation here and here, so it was quadratic. In two dimensions, on the other hand, it's this diagram. Del mu, j mu is F. This j is just how the, the matter field transforms under the symmetry. That's just the charge under the symmetry. But this j carries charge under gauge field. All our size had charge 1 under symmetry. So that 1 goes overall outside. So the, the, the quantity here should have been qi qi. But qi was the uh, charge under the symmetry that being considered. But this is one for all, or at least equal for all. So just take it away. Clear? Okay? And then, uh, uh, and then, uh, so it's proportional to this, this capital QI, where QI is the gate charge. Is this clear? Everyone's with, okay. I'm moving on unless somebody tells me it's not clear. <laughs> okay? So the condition that these left and right moving, these chiral uh, R symmetries, are actually non-anomalous. The condition for that is that the sum of charges of our matter fields is zero. Okay? For this reason, we're going to study a very particular field content. In later classes, well, in later sections in the paper and maybe in later classes, we'll generalize to more, more general things. So charge will right? What? Charge will so what, will what do you mean the charge will renormalize? E renormalizes. That's overall outside. The relative charges of the fields don't get renormalized. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So we're, what we're going to do is to take fields phi i, okay, and give them each charge 1. I hope Witten doesn't choose minus 1, we'll see. Okay, there will be n of these. And we'll take another scalar field p, and we'll give it charge minus n. So by construction, our model will obey sum over charges is equal to 0. And therefore, we'll have both the left and the right moving uh, R symmetries as non-anomalous symmetries. Okay. Now, we needn't have done this. Nothing would have gone wrong had we studied a model. There wouldn't have been anything fundamentally wrong if we studied a model without the left and right moving R symmetries. But we'll see we wouldn't have got anything interesting with those models. These R symmetries being non-anomalous will allow us to give some, get something interesting. Is this clear? Okay, excellent. So now we're in business. Now we really know what our model is. Okay, okay. And one last thing I want to say. Um, one last thing I want to say um, goes as follows. As you remember, for instance, from the intraligator Wecht story, as you remember, if you give me one class of R symmetries, and our theory has some flavor symmetries, I can always add flavor symmetries to R symmetries and keep these having R symmetries. Now you can ask, what kind of R symmetries, what kind of flavor symmetries does our, uh, does our model have? There are obvious flavor symmetries. Okay? There are obvious flavor symmetries, exactly, S, U, N. And in particular, we have flavor symmetries which phase. Okay? 
just the u1 to the power n, and then an extra u1 for p. In particular, that's a flavor symmetry. Okay. Now, I could always add uh, these. Uh, I could, I, I, you, I, we have the whole sun, but we'll soon be adding a su uh, super potential that will not allow for all of the sun. But we'll do it in, you'll see. Okay, so these are in particular flavor symmetries that will be uh, uh, there in our model. Okay, good. So I can always combine this kind of flavor symmetry with the R symmetry we've just discussed to get another R symmetry. I'm saying this because we're soon going to be adding a super potential. And once we add that super potential, the naive R symmetry will no longer be of a symmetry of the problem. But we will do it in such a way such, a, such that a combination of this flavor symmetry and the naive R symmetry will continue to be a symmetry. Okay, great. So now we're in business. Now we're in business and we go back to our scalar potential. Our scalar potential was, let's remember, there was uh, sum over qi mod phi i squared, but qi is now all one we've chosen, mod phi i square minus n times mod p square, okay, minus n times mod p square uh, plus, um, I'll get completely right. minus r, the whole thing squared, there's some half, but don't worry about that. That's the d term potential, okay? Then we have the f term potential, which is of course uh, del f phi by del, um, okay, I'll be writing that, I'll just write it as mod f squared for a moment and plus two sigma bar sigma uh, mod phi i square. Okay, this is our full potential. Now, we want to make a choice of um, uh, a super potential, okay? And the super potential we're going to choose, of course, has to be the super potential we're going to choose, of course, has to be uh, a gauge invariant. So it's a function of these n phi's, okay, and this p. So let us make the following choice. Let us make the choice that this this uh, super potential takes the form w, which is equal to p times g of phi i. Okay, so that G is a uh, dimension P, is a homogeneous polynomial of uh, degree D, uh, degree N. Okay, this ensures that the superpotential is gauge invariant because the net charge of the superpotential then is zero. So under uh, gauge transformations, it does not transform. Okay, so now we've got our, our model really clear. So now let's work out. Let's work out the 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 f term potential in more detail. One term is when we differentiate with respect to p. That gives us mod g squared because del f del w by del p is g, and then that mod squared. And then the other term is plus mod p squared times del g by del phi i mod squared sum. Yeah, so this is the f term part of the potential, uh, super potential that the d term we've written down there. So this was d term put 
this is the f term part and then there is the sigma part. Notice that the potential is a sum of three positive definite terms, d term, f term and super potential. Okay. So let us first search now for supersymmetric vacuum of this classical potential. Okay. Let us first take the case that R is very large and positive. We want to send all these three terms to 0. Um, let me let me clear out the stuff above so you can see the terms for you. Clear this out. So the potential is the sum of those three terms, you can see them on the board and we, we've got R very large and positive. Okay, so suppose R is very large and positive, then let's first solve the d term flatness condition, the d term is equal to 0. Clearly the only way to do that is to have at least one of the phi i's being very large and positive. Okay, but if at even one of the phi i's is large and positive, then from the sigma term and the potential. The only way that that is going to be 0 is if little sigma is equal to 0. Okay, so we make our first conclusion. Sigma is equal to 0. Okay, fine. Now, um, uh, now let's turn to the f term, f term part of the potential. Okay, the f term part of the potential requires to start with the g is equal to 0, okay? But g is some, some homogeneous polynomial, the easiest way to satisfy this and we will soon see the only way of relevance to us is to set p to 0. So the mod g squared will be 0 because, um, uh, sorry, sorry, what, what am I saying? Uh, I want g to be 0, so that's a condition. g is equal to 0 is a condition on phi's. This is a condition on phi's. And then we've got mod p squared times this del, del g by del uh, phi i, the whole thing squared. Okay? Unless there are places where all, there is some phi at which all of them go to zero. Together, the only way of solving that equation is that p equals zero. Now we're going to demand that our polynomials of this form such that all del g by del phi i's cannot be 0 simultaneously except at phi i equals 0 of course. But phi i equals 0 is not replaced with which will solve the d term condition because d term condition requires that at least one phi i has to be large. This will have geometrical significance. In fact, we will demand that you, you will see. Okay. Uh, so assuming that g is of this nice form, it has a geometrical name which we'll come to. Okay, the only way to solve this equation is by setting p equals 0. So we have p equals 0, sigma equals 0, and our space of vacua is parameterized by the, the, the hypersurface g is equal to 0. Okay, now since p is equal to 0, okay, imagine the space Cn whose coordinates are the phi 1, phi 2, up to phi n. Since p is equal to 0 from the d term potential there, that first equation tells us that we've got the Cn, it's a 2n dimensional real space, and uh, what we've got is a sphere 
of radius square root r in the two, dimen two n dimensional real space? From data. What? From d term, exactly, from the d term. So we've got a sphere of a two n, di two n dimensional real space and a sphere of dimension square root r in that space. Are we looking at cn or cn plus uh, cn because b is zero. So effectively, we're at cn. Okay. Now, uh, if we have a set of vacua such that, let's say I give you a vacuum and you give me another vacuum in which all phi's are scaled by e to the power i alpha, where i alpha is common between all the phi's. Okay? If we have such a vacuum, okay, then if we have such a vacuum, then uh, um, uh, these two vacua are gauge equivalent because all phi's have charge one, so e to the power i alpha is just a gauge transformation. So any two vacua that differ by common gauge, common phase, for all phi's are to be identified. Okay? So do you see that the fact, now, we've, so ignoring the W term, the F term condition for a moment, these two conditions take us, are in, we're in CN, we're in a sphere of some big radius, and things with, with equal phase are, are, equi, are equivalent. But this is exactly the space CPN. Because remember that CPN is a space of n complex numbers such that all number, if you rescale all numbers by the, multiplying by the same complex number, you get the, the same answer. I mean, it's the same point. Now, every complex number is a phase times, an, uh, times a modulus. We can gauge fix that modulus transformation by demanding we live in a sphere of a particular size. So living on a particular size but being equivalent two points being uh, equivalent to each other under phasing is the same as living in CPN. So the first two conditions, I mean the D-term condition, now tells us that our space of vacua is in CPN. Okay? And the F-term condition tells us that we've got a hypersurface, a co one co complex co-dimension one manual sub-manifold in CPN. Moreover, this hypersurface is a, a hypersurface of a very particular kind. It's a kind made by, a, by an n-dimensional polynomial. It's f is equal to, uh, it's a homogeneous polynomial. In CPN, you need homogeneous polynomials because it makes no sense under scaling. But it's a homogeneous genius polynomial of dimension n. Okay? So, classically, what is the low energy physics of our theory? Classically, the low energy physics of our theory is the physics some, is a sigma model on some sub where the target space is lies on a co-dimension one hypersurface in CPN. May, where this co-dimension one hypersurface is a set of zeros of a degree n polynomial that we have specified. Is this clear? Is it clear what I mean by classically our physics reduces to a sigma model? Is that statement clear? Mean classically or in IR? Well, IR we will have to see. We will have to check that quantum effects don't change this. But I'm saying in the IR, okay, good. If we believe classical physics, if we believe that there are no quantum corrections to the statement. Okay? So why? Firstly, we, in the IR we float, yes, in the IR, our classical guess for IR physics. Okay? Is this. So why? We've, we just looked at the space of vacua, but we've got an extremely strongly coupled theory in the IR. This is the dimensional analysis we went through in the last class. That at very low energies, one plus one dimensional gauge theory is always arbitrarily strongly coupled. So the theory is very strongly coupled in the IR, which means the deviations away from the, uh, um, uh, from vacuum manifold should be suppressed. You know, the potential should be very strong. Uh, we will see this with some computations as we go on. Okay? So the guess would be that we've got, that we fluctuate on the, quant on the manifold of vacuum. 
Now, different points on our one plus one dimensional field theory could be at different points on that vacuum. Okay, and this is exactly a sigma model. A sigma model where the fields lie on this vacuum manifold, and but the fields are locations on this manifold, and we've got a one plus one dimensional field theory where the fields are at locations on this vacuum manifold. This would be a naive guess for the physics of this theory at very, uh, very low energies. Okay, now you know naive guesses can sometimes go wrong. We will study this in various ways, but if if we were very naive, this would be a guess. Is this clear? Okay, now let us return. I will take like five ten minutes more. If that's okay. Let us return to the analysis of symmetries. We talked about the R symmetries of our theory. But we talked about them in the absence of a superpotential. And now we've added a superpotential. So does this model still have an R symmetry? Does it still have an R symmetry? Does it still have a left moving R symmetry and a right moving R symmetry? Okay. Now, uh, you see, under the R symmetry, the naive R symmetry, we, so let's remember that our superpotential was D2 theta PG. Okay. Um, had all had now we want under this R symmetry we want this guy to be invariant. Okay, were P and G not to transform, it won't work. Right, because uh, um, d, uh, d theta carries charge under the R symmetry. Okay, but we can always use some of the flavor symmetries. Okay, we can always use some of the flavor symmetries to make sure that, that it works. So for instance, let me give you a, a, a concrete choice. Um, yeah, so f for instance, we could choose that uh, the charge, the R symmetry charge of P is equal to minus one and of all the fields phi is equal to zero. This minus one will compensate this d2 theta. Okay, maybe it's plus one. We, we, we could make that choice. Is this clear? Okay, so we modify our definition of the R symmetry by including, by mixing in this flavor symmetry. Okay, we do that so that this uh, um, superpotential stays invariant. Now our theory has a non-anomalous R symmetry. Okay, now why were we so interested in non-anomalous R symmetries? Non-anomalous left and right moving R symmetries separately. Why did we want them? This goes.
And in particular, if k is not equal to n, they can prove that it doesn't exist. But in our case, we're in luck because we have k is equal to n. What? So it's possible. Always is a hard word. <laughs> but we can reasonably conjecture that the IR physics is superconformally invariant. And then what will it be if it's superconform? It'll be the sigma model on the rich in fact metric in, uh, in, in, in this dimension. This metric is in fact a Calabayao metric. Okay? So the sigma model on this particular Calabayao made by this degree k polynomial, this hypersurface constructed out of this degree n polynomial, g, okay? You choose g as you like. That will determine which Calabayao you get. Okay? Is our conjecture for the IR physics of the model when R is very large and positive. We will come back to this conjecture next class and examine it in a little more detail. But at least it's reasonable, right? Things fit together. Okay, next class we'll study it more.